All right, let's just cover topic one of your textbook. So we're going to go through a basic introduction of analytical chemistry, which you could basically summarize as the science of chemical measurement. So in this video, we'll be looking at a couple of things, the definition of analytical chemistry, so what's it good for? We're also going to talk about the difference between qualitative and quantitative analysis, something that we'll cover a lot of in this semester. And then finally, we'll go through a demonstration. Now, this is something that I recorded a little bit earlier uh, while I was in the lab. I know, the first thing you think of with analytical chemistry is this device right here, a burette. Uh, it couldn't be more boring, and, and honestly, in my research lab, I've almost never used it. So this is not exactly the best description of analytical, but it does do something quite well. It allows you to measure an unknown. It allows you to determine the concentration of something through a simple device. Devices have gotten a little bit more complicated over the years. Um, so here's some earlier examples. We have an analytical balance, a pH meter, uh, spectrometers, and then my favorite little example, this thing right over here. I'm wondering if you even realize what that is. Well, it's actually a microscope, and the way that it works, there's a tiny little bead there. So if you ever notice like a water droplet that kind of catches the light and magnifies, that's exactly what's going on here. So in this device, you have to stand right there with the device to your eye, and the, the specimen would be behind it. This is a very old machine, but you imagine how much it's been able to allow us to do, to see things that we couldn't see. So what this microscope has done for biology, let's say, uh, a lot of analytical instrumentation has been doing for chemistry, being allowing to do chemical analysis. So devices have gotten a lot more complicated over the years. These are two instruments that you can find in my research lab, not these very ones here, but one of them is called a mass spectrometer, which is a device that allows you to weigh the molecular weight of a molecule. And the other thing is called a liquid chromatography instrument, which is designed to separate compounds. So the combination of the two allows you to separate and then identify complex components of a mixture. I'm also particularly fond of this example here. So this is a, a microscopic image of some cells, but they've been stained with different fluorescent molecules. So this is a fluorescence microscopy experiment. And fluorescence allows you to take a lot of different types of measurements to probe different kinds of molecules. And here's another example of what you can do with fluorescence. So DNA sequencing, basically you'll take your different uh, base pairs of DNA, G, C, A, and T, and you can tag them with four different fluorescent compounds. And then through a process of separation, you can basically tell what the genome sequence is. So this is one version of a technique that's allowed us to sequence human DNA. So just to give you an example of some of the stuff that goes on in my research. So this is a device that's used to separate proteins. It's a device that we've called gel-free. Um, so you can, you can get this box here, but really this is the device that was built in our lab. And what it allows you to do is take a complex protein mixture and separate them according to size. So that's what you're looking at over here. Each fraction represents a bunch of proteins beginning with the smaller ones to medium and then working your way up to large. And the magic of that comes from inside here. You can see these little tubes. So protein is placed on one side of the device and we actually pass an electric current through it, which forces the proteins to migrate from one end of a gel to the other side. So we'll talk a lot more about the topic of separation as a later topic in this course when we deal with chromatography. For now, let's talk about qualitative and quantitative analysis. So these are just two of the most basic definitions of analytical chemistry, and it all boils down to these questions here. Qualitative is what is our substance, and then quantitative refers to how much it is. The two of them are quite closely connected because if you think about the, the ability to measure something, to get the concentration, you need to be able to detect it. So we have to talk about a detection limit. Uh, we don't know what something is until we know at least that it has something there. And this relates a lot to early days when people said, well, chemicals, they just, they weren't in our water, for example, because we just couldn't find them. That's not to say that they're not there or that they're not even harmful. It's just, it takes a sophisticated type of instrumentation to be able to make that measurement. So what is analytical chemistry good for? Well, as I just said, um, we could use it to study water. So uh, as a way of understanding what kinds of molecules are in our water, uh, whether it's safe to drink, whether it's safe to swim in, uh, and then you could think of all the different critters, be it metals or biological components, any type of that. It doesn't matter what the substance is. It all comes down to chemistry, being able to tell what these substances are. Now, forensics is another great example of an application of analytical chemistry because with forensics, you're combining the aspect of defining what something, something is and how much it is 
with that issue of law. So in this case, we really do care whether our answers are right or wrong, because in this case, it's going to, well, decide if somebody goes to jail. Now, this kind of extends from forensics. So we're looking at, at the, the purity of sport, for example. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody's aware who this is. This fellow is Ben Johnson. So Ben Johnson's kind of notorious uh, for having won the Olympic gold uh, in the 100 meter dash, who was later stripped of that gold because he was caught taking an illicit substance. So it's, it's chemical analysis is allowing us to determine what that is. And of course, I'm talking to you now through a video instead of live in person because of these critters right over here. So when it comes to doing viral compound analysis, it sounds like the topic of medicine, but there's a direct interplay between medicine and chemistry. So chemical analysis can be used to determine viral count, all of this testing that we're dealing with and false positives and things of that nature. These are all topics of analytical chemistry, right down to how those measurements were, were created, how it is that we're able to detect if somebody carries coronavirus, yes or no, um, and hopefully how we'll be able to combat this, this and hopefully how we'll be able to combat this disease uh, in the near future. So I'd like to take you through a quick demonstration of what we can do with analytical chemistry. In this example here, we're gonna determine the concentration of ethanol and what better sample than this right here since it seems like we're all using it every day. Now I know what you're thinking. It isn't that challenging to tell the difference between water and ethanol. I mean, you can just smell them or you can taste them. So you could think of, of your own human senses as detectors to tell the difference between chemicals. But let's just say for, for an instant that we're not actually going to taste our compounds to, to find out what they are. And besides, the question is really about how much ethanol we have in our sample. So we want an accurate measurement right down to the last percent. So I think this device right here is a great example of how we can do that. So this is a breathalyzer instrument. Basically, you blow into it and the device is going to read your blood alcohol concentration. It doesn't really do that directly. It's more so relating how much ethanol is in your vapor in the in the air that you're breathing out, and then you can kind of relate that back to the concentration in the blood. But still, this device is capable of figuring out how much ethanol you have in your sample. So how does it do that? Well, it can do so in a lot of different ways, but this is actually the original way that the device was done. It uses this chemical here and a chemical reaction to be able to tell the difference between ethanol and let's say water. So we need to be able to, to sense the compound. This compound here is potassium dichromate, and the crystals are a nice bright orange color like this. If you put it in solution, then you get an orange solution uh, that you see in these test tubes right over here. So dichromate is a strong oxidizer. So that means it can participate with ethanol in a redox type reaction. And I'll show you the equation right here. So as you can see, ethanol reacts with dichromate. You need a little bit of acid here. Let me just balance that. And then uh, in the process, we make acetic acid and chromium-3. So this in itself isn't that particularly revealing because, well, we just turn ethanol into acetic acid. But what is revealing is that the dichromate begins as that orange color that I just showed you, but the chromium-3 is a bright blue color. So let's see what that looks like over here. You can see all these, these vials, they already have the dichromate in there. And what we're gonna do is add ethanol in increasing concentrations. So I'm indicating the concentration of ethanol that you see going in with a pipette. And each time that happens, a reaction will form. We're also going to be adding our hand sanitizer. I had to add it at different concentrations. So 100X means that I've diluted that hand sanitizer by a factor of 100. And we can see over the course, this is being sped up. So maybe over a 10 minute period, we develop a different color. It goes from orange to, I know it's kind of hard to see, but we see that this nice bright blue color. So this early sample didn't have much ethanol in it, somewhere in the middle, and then to the highest levels, you see that it's sort of completely converted into that dark blue. So to stand these up on a rack, you can see the reaction here that when we didn't have enough ethanol, we basically leave the dichromate solution behind. The ethanol is actually our limiting reagent. So we have dichromate left over and it looks orange. On the other side, we've added so much alcohol that there's no dichromate left. It's all being converted into the chromium-3 and that's why it looks blue. So you can see quite quickly that these two different test tubes reveal the concentration of ethanol. This one has very little and this one has a lot. To be able to actually calibrate exactly how much we have, we're going to do what we call an absorbance measurement. So this is basically, we take a light source and we pass it through the sample. We're going to take a look at it right from the other side. And as the light passes through, there's kind of a complementary color going on. So it looks blue because it's absorbing everything but the blue. 
which means that the blue light will pass through while the orange color will be absorbed. So I won't take you through the actual measurement process. We'll do that a little bit later in this course, but these numbers correspond to the readings that we've taken. You see the different vials, the concentration of ethanol that they had, and the absorbance readings. I happen to do this three times just to sort of get a sense of the, the precision, and I've taken an average and the standard deviation of our measurements. At the bottom, we also have our unknown sample with the different dilution factors carried onto it. So I'm going to take this data and plot it on a calibration curve. So the first thing you notice is the curve isn't actually straight. And I like straight lines, so that means I'm basically going to focus in on a narrow region and then drop the data points at the higher end. So when we do that, you can see that the line is a lot straighter. I can draw a straight line through it, and it looks linear, but in fact, there still is a point over here that's a little high. So we're going to discard that data point as well, and I'm only going to take the bottom points uh, to represent the straight line. So we can draw a trend line and we can see there's an equation for the line. So now that we have this data, we can basically take our unknown solutions and we can plot this on the curve. Now I notice that the most concentrated samples, the absorbance is actually above the calibration curve. So I'm not even going to measure them. I'll just take that bottom number over here and then the 0.243, that's an absorbance about here. So I can take the reading and well, you know, we have the equation. So we might as well plug the equation in and calculate the number from there. 0.71 would refer to the concentration of our sample that was diluted by a, a factor of 100. So the real concentration is multiplied by that. With a few extra digits uh, carried through, the final concentration of our, our hand sanitizer actually worked out to be 72%. And that's good because that's exactly what it was made to, or at least 70 to 75. I think the error in that really comes to my haste in being able to take these measurements. We have to realize that whenever we do a measurement, we don't always get the perfect exact answer. Uh, and that's a big factor of what we'll be talking about in the coming weeks in this class. So the next topic will relate to statistical analysis and regression, and we'll soon see a lot of the things that we've talked about in this topic here. So this was just meant as a quick overview of some of the different things you'll see in this class. We'll see you around.